This program is brought to you by Dolku Media. Fixing South Sudan Ideas for the New Nation. With award winning journalist Madin Mor. Absolutely. Honorable Achim, as you can see, the ideas of the initiatives are varied. The July, uh, on July 8th, uh, the clashes in J1 took place, which was very unfortunate. Including uh, country specific ones, uh, which. Uh, the well and continue, continue to be. Fixing South Sudan, ideas for the new nation. Hello and welcome to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Mading Or. This week on Fixing South Sudan, I look at the upcoming high-level revitalization forum for the agreement on the resolution of conflict in the Republic of South Sudan. What's the forum agenda and is it a good idea for fixing South Sudan? What role? that the United States of America and its striker allies intend to play to ensure successful conclusion of the revitalization forum. And is Washington at odds with Juba? How can the two friendly nations mend their declining historical ties? Joining us for this historic interview is Excellency Michael K. Morrow, Child First United States Embassy in the Republic of South Sudan, Juba. Sir, we are elated to welcome you to Fixing South Sudan. How are you? Thank you, Mading. Thank you for inviting me to your show. You are most welcome. Welcome to the show. So the high-level revitalization forum is uh, reconvening again soon in Ethiopia. It is the hottest buzzword in Juba. Everyone is talking about it. And the question is, what is the revitalization forum? What is there to be revitalized? The one key word here with the forum is opportunity. The forum is an opportunity for the people of South Sudan, for the country of South Sudan, for the government of South Sudan, and also for the opposition leaders. An opportunity to bring peace and to end the war that has now, been, uh, has now entered its fifth year. And who is who's coming to the forum? Uh, the government, of course and uh, the, um, the main opposition group uh, known as the I.O., and then um, another 12 or 13 armed opposition groups, uh, as well as uh, a number of other uh, participants and players from South Sudanese civil society, church leaders, women's leaders, youth leaders, and also many supporters from the outside world that are trying to um, help uh, forge this peace process and move it forward. What's your understanding of the word revitalization? Revitalization, it can mean whatever people want it to mean. What the key word is peace. Uh, this country deserves peace. The people of South Sudan have suffered for too long. Um, as I said, uh, the current conflict that began in December of 2013 has now entered the beginning of its fifth year. And so this is an opportunity for all the parties to sit down, put their heads together, set aside their narrow personal interests, and put the interests of the nation first. And it's a great opportunity to do this, and I, I, I'm eager to see the parties seize this opportunity and make something good of it. Can you say categorically that the high-level revitalization forum is a good idea for fixing South Sudan? It's a good idea because it's an opportunity. And so it's going to depend on what the parties do with that opportunity. Uh, we commend um, EGAD and the EGAD foreign ministers for working so hard last fall to go out and reach out and touch all the different parties, they came and spent several days in South Sudan, talked to civil society, and because of their efforts, all the parties agreed to come to Addis for round one in December. That in itself was a great accomplishment. The sides agreed on a cessation of hostilities agreement. That was a good accomplishment. Implementation of that agreement, I wouldn't call that an accomplishment yet, but it's a good place to start. Um, now, another accomplishment is, as far as we know, every single party that was there in December has agreed to come back for round two in Addis, which starts on Monday. So it's really up to the South Sudanese parties to take this opportunity and make something of it. That will determine whether this is a good idea or not. And the people of South Sudan are accustomed to their leaders going to Addis Ababa to bring back peace, the current peace that is being revitalized. 
was negotiated in Addis Ababa, and then it faced some challenges. So what opportunity is Addis going to provide? Is going to be done differently? I think uh, one thing that will be looked at is uh, it's clear that the, um, uh, the current political structure is not working. It's not bringing the peace to South Sudan. So some things need to be adjusted. Uh, people will look back at the 2015 peace agreement um, as, a, as a beginning point, as a, uh, 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 as a structural agreement, and find out where it needs to be changed and improved. Uh, the two most important areas that will be discussed will be the um, governance structure, and the um, security structure. And ultimately what's needed is a governance structure that can uh, uh, produce an inclusive uh, uh, government with an appropriate transition period that will allow all sides to put down their guns and plan for a new South Sudan um, that will be able to govern itself without violence. And it'll, the transition period, depending on how long it will be, will lead to elections. Um, but the transition period has to happen first, the ground has to be prepared, and only then can elections happen. Um, on the security side, clearly uh, there are too many different fighting forces in South Sudan. Uh, a formula needs to be found to consolidate those forces into a single national army that serves all of the people of South Sudan, not one group or this group or that group. So political transition that leads to elections with an inclusive arrangement and a security structure that is a single national army that serves the entire nation. Those are the two key pieces, and if, if, uh, if the outlines of an agreement can be found on those two key pieces, uh, I think the people of South Sudan will have a lot to be optimistic about. So the forum provides uh, an opportunity to achieve permanent ceasefire. Absolutely. That is, that's what we are hoping. Absolutely. How does it do that? It'll be up to the parties, again. Uh, what's really critical is that for every South Sudanese leader, every South Sudanese person who participates in the, uh, in the forum, whether they're government, whether they're opposition, whether they're civil society, they need to set aside narrow group interests, narrow personal interests, narrow financial interests, and decide what is best for the country of South Sudan, what is best for the people of South Sudan. And if they can define that in their own minds, then they can come together and make some of the hard compromises that need to be made for peace to go forward. Because no negotiation is, is successful until every party decides what it can give up and what it can get. And, and every you, side needs to be prepared to give things up. And what do you think should be given up by both sides to achieve peace? That's not for me to define. Um, what we've done is we've led the parties to a process where they can have a dialogue and come up with those answers. It needs to be a South Sudanese solution. Um, there's different formulas that I've seen for power sharing, different formulas I've seen for economic reform, different formulas I've seen for how to consolidate into a single national army. Um, any one of those formulas can work, but it's, it, it can't be someone from the United States or the UK or even the United Nations who can, who can decide that. It has to be the parties themselves who decide that. The what we've done is create the conditions for those talks to take place in a serious manner. But a compromise is necessary. Yes. Yeah. I can't define what the compromise will look like. But um, compromise should be looked at as a positive word, not a negative word. Um, every side needs to, needs to realize that they have to give up something in order to serve the people of South Sudan. Because that's ultimately what this is about, is the people of South Sudan, the people of this country who've been suffering from fighting for, from, for far too long. Let me get you a, a quotation from a publication by the Juba-based uh, Sud Institute. And they made this observation, quote, the parties need a constructive engagement that mixes incentives and threats as well as clear international plan for post-agreement peace efforts such as plans for economic revival and reconstruction." Unquote. The questions are, what are the consequences for non-compliance, the stakes in American parlance, and what are the rewards, yeah. the carrots? Let me talk about the carrots first. Uh, in all of my meetings with government officials here and with civil society, and I've also traveled outside and met with some opposition leaders, I've said the same message to all those groups, which is if the, if, if the parties in South Sudan can come to a peace agreement, they can count on the international community to step forward and help provide a peace dividend. Uh, the peace dividend can take many different forms, but clearly the economy here needs a boost. Um, people need to find work. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the oil needs to start flowing again. So I'm confident that a, a peace dividend awaits if the peace comes first. 
you can't have dividend before peace. You have to have peace before dividend. So that's what the carrots are. There is money available for good behavior. I'm confident that there will be support available to help carry South Sudan forward if the guns go down. And have we have seen time and again the agreement has been facing challenges. And so if the parties don't go through with the agreement as it is hoped to end to achieve permanent ceasefire, what happens? What options are there? The um, EGAD, uh, together with the AU and the UN, have made very clear uh, what awaits. Uh, Under Secretary uh, General of the United Nations, Guterres, uh, came to Addis uh, last week. He met with the um, AU summit. He met with the, um, the AU uh, heads of state, or sorry, uh, he met with the AU and EGAD heads of state. And they released a statement that was very clear that uh, harsh measures and punitive measures will be readied um, in the event that there are spoilers to the peace process, regardless of which side they come from. And um, some of these measures could include things like uh, travel bans on individuals who, who refuse to advance the cause of peace, asset freezes for individuals who uh, refuse to advance the cause of peace. And um, these harsh, harsh measures, if needed, would be directed not only against field commanders uh, in the bush who are, who are engaging in offensive operations, but also the political leaders who they answer to, because ultimately the political leaders have to take responsibility for the field commanders who are, uh, who are answering to them. So uh, that's been a very clear, very strong statement from the, uh, the AU, uh, EGAD, and the UN together. The Troika is with them on that. So the point to make here is that there is increasing solidarity, increasing resolve on the part of the broad international community that this is the chance, uh, this is the opportunity that must be seized, and if there are spoilers standing in the way, they will feel uh, the very harsh measures from not any one country or not any one organization, but all of those countries and organizations that I mentioned. When, so when, we're seeing real solidarity here on the part of the international community. When we speak about revitalization or revival, we are really talking about failures. There were failures in the agreement and in the implementation of the agreement. So what lessons have been learned, and how will they be corrected? The biggest lesson is to keep trying. Um, if you look around the history of the world where there were difficult conflicts that had to be solved through negotiations, um, very rarely did it work the first time around. Uh, often they had to do multiple ceasefires, multiple rounds of negotiations. So um, uh, we're encouraged that all the parties have agreed to, um, to, to come back to the negotiating table. Um, they had round one in December. They're having round two now. So the first lesson is simply don't give up. Um, uh, the second lesson is just, uh, I think, to, to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, there were a limited number of parties to the, uh, the talks during the 2015 peace agreement. And I think one lesson that was learned is that there are additional voices that need to be heard. And I'm not just, I'm not just talking about other armed groups. Uh, I'm talking about civil society, church leaders, women leaders, uh, uh, youth leaders, all of them are part of the EGAD process at the Revitalization Forum. And I think that's a critically important element to have the voice of civil society uh, uh, present for that. Uh, civil society has a big role to play in the future of this country. Um, they shouldn't listen, civil society, South Sudanese people shouldn't listen to those who try to intimidate them and tell them not to speak up and not to report violations that they see. They should, they should take courage and they should do their role, they should speak up. Uh, they should talk to their church leaders, talk to their traditional leaders, talk to their uh, 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 educational leaders, and, and raise their voice. Uh, it's important that the civil society of South Sudan raises its voice to be heard as part of this process. So we should be more inclusive. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think everyone has agreed to that because, um, again, um, uh, all the parties um, showed up for round one. They're all coming back for round two. So I think there's a consensus that inclusivity is the way to go. Part of the failure included the fact that the government had strong obje objections or reservations. Would you say that was part of the failure of the arses? And what is being done this time to basically factor in what the government is saying? Yeah, I mean, the, the arses was almost three years ago. It was before my time here. What I'm focused on is what we're doing now. And, um, you know, our encouragement uh, to the government is, um, uh, is, is based on four things. And it really derives from uh, the very good meeting that Nikki Haley had when she was here uh, last fall and met with President Keir. Uh, Ambassador Haley, uh, 
sought for, asked for commitments from President Kiir on four general areas. One is that the government would engage seriously in the peace talks. Two is that the government would um, seriously pursue a cessation of hostilities. Three, that the government would support free access uh, across the board for humanitarian workers so that they can do their work and, and deliver food to the people who are suffering. And four uh, was a, a commitment from the government to embrace UNMIS as a partner that's helping to bring peace to this country. Um, those are the four things they talked about. Um, President Keir uh, made commitments on those issues. After the meeting, they exchanged letters solidifying that. And now we are taking account of that. And um, we, are, we are looking for President Keir to lead. We are holding, looking to hold him accountable to those commitments he made. We've had some disappointments along the way, but that doesn't mean we're giving up. Uh, we continue to press for the president to lead and for his government to lead and, and really lead the way forward for the people of South Sudan and, and bring them a bright, uh, a bright and peaceful future. Sir, can the international community be held accountable for what they have been doing in South Sudan? When we talk about this agreement, it was signed under heavy pressure. And the government objected to the idea of two armies. And we know what happened in J1, clutches erupted. And then the former first vice president had to flee uh, Juba. So does the international community take some blame for the spiraling into conflict? Well, we certainly recognize there were weaknesses in the 2015 agreement. I mean, we, we, we've seen that that agreement didn't work. It didn't bring peace to this country. Uh, I think now, as we look forward to what this next round of uh, peace talks has to bring, it has to have several elements. One element has to be a transition period with inclusive representation that leads to a free and fair election. Um, another element has to be uh, restructuring the security sector. And I think there is very broad consensus that the, um, the, the 2015 formula of having two rival armies side by side was not a formula for success. So I think a different formula will need to be found. But again, um, all sides will have to make compromises in the course of finding that solution so that we can have, so that your country can have a, uh, a, a secure security architecture that exists to protect the interests of the whole country, exists to protect the interests of all the people, rather than different armed groups, each one looking to, to, to protect its own narrow interests. So the international community has regrets about the grand design of RCIS. I would just say we recognize that it didn't work, but rather than giving up, we're trying again, and that's why EGAD worked so hard to, to bring together this revitalization forum. And now the ball is in the court of the people and especially the leaders of South Sudan, both government and opposition, to seize this opportunity. Let's take a break from you. Great. Welcome to Dolku Media Services. We have so many services for you, such as video production, camera hiring, sound system hiring, event management, passport photo, stand-up comedy, printing, drama, music, dance, multimedia, and photography. Dolku Media Services, our culture, our pride. Welcome back to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Mading Or. With us is His Excellency Michael K. Morrow, Shahid the First, United States Embassy in the Republic of South Sudan, Juba. We are happy to welcome him for another round. Welcome back to the show. Thank you, Mading. So the United States was a strategic and historical ally and friend of the people and the government of South Sudan with U.S. backing, South Sudanese achieved the right to self-determination. The key question is, what's responsible for the downgrading of relations between the two nations? The United States, uh, as you know, was a strong supporter uh, of South Sudan independence, going all the way back to the liberation struggle. Uh, we helped you celebrate uh, that fine day in 2011 when South Sudan celebrated its independence. Uh, since that time, we've invested significantly in this country. Uh, since independence, we have provided, uh, we, since independence, we've been the, the leading uh, donor country uh, in the whole world towards South Sudan. Uh, since independence, we've provided over $3 billion in humanitarian assistance, and we've provided over $2 billion in development assistance. And unfortunately, we feel this tremendous investment has not resulted in the kind of good results that we expected. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, South Sudan has currently entered year five of the ongoing conflict. Uh, South Sudan's population is, is, is displaced. Um, of the 12 million people in this country, uh, more than two million, in fact, almost two and a half million are living outside the country as refugees. Uh, almost two million are living outside of their homes in displaced camps inside South Sudan. So more than a third of the population is not currently living in their own homes, and that's a very bad dynamic. Um, the economy uh, has been uh, uh, shrinking at an alarming rate. Um, just to compare a few figures, uh, economic growth in South Sudan in 2013 was 13%. Uh, this last year it was negative 10%, so the economy is shrinking. Uh, South Sudan's national income is down 80% since December of 2013 when the latest conflict began. Uh, oil production is dropping at an alarming rate. Um, as we know, this country relies almost 90% of its revenue on, on oil, but the oil production has been cut in half from about uh, 235,000 barrels a day in 2013 to half of that today, about 120,000 barrels. And the, the negative indicators go on and on. Um, the inflation rate, uh, the inflation rate was flat in 2013. Now, in the most recent year, the inflation rate was 117 uh, percent. Look at the exchange rate of the South Sudanese pound. Uh, in 2013, it was three pounds to one dollar. Now, today, it's uh, 131 pounds to one dollar, and that's the official rate. So it's, this is my way of illustrating that you know, the reason for the downturn in relationship is, is our disappointment with the way things are going. Uh, the collapse of the economy, due partly to mismanagement, due partly to some corruption, uh, the inability to find a solution to a war that now enters its fifth year. Uh, and it has made us very um, impatient, and it has made us want to push for change. And talking about impatience, South Sudan is only a few years old. It's called a new nation, a baby nation. The United States of America is 200 years old. So. Why the impatience? Is this not a normal part of growing up? Why the impatience with the baby nation? Well, I think when we're talking about uh, one third of the population being chased from their own homes, when we're talking about over five million people facing severe food insecurity, um, these are not the typical growing pains of a new nation. This is a crisis proportion. And we're here to try and help. Um, as I said before, we've been with South Sudan from the beginning. Uh, if the United States didn't care about South Sudan, we never would have sent Nikki Haley here in last October. If the United States didn't care about South Sudan, you wouldn't hear Nikki Haley and other leading administration officials talking about South Sudan. And if, they, if the United States cared about South Sudan, why has it been consistently advocating for slapping of arms embargo on a nation that has existential enemies? South Sudan is awash in weapons. Most of the weapons are being used South Sudanese on South Sudanese. Um, you've seen the figures, uh, thousands of people killed in the last five years of this conflict, two million refugees, another two million internally displaced people. Uh, something needs to be done. And if peace can't be achieved through negotiations, then peace may need to be achieved through other means, such as cutting off the flow of weapons, because it's these weapons that are killing the people of South Sudan. And unfortunately, it's South Sudanese who are pulling the trigger. So uh, that's why it's so important to focus on this revitalization forum as an opportunity to change that dynamic, stop the killing, stop the food insecurity, give a chance for the economy to grow, and again, put the interests of the whole nation ahead of narrow interests aligned to one political party or one ethnic group. You spoke of uh, Nikki Haley, uh, the American ambassador to the UN. She made some uh, pointed remarks recently, quote, the government of South Sudan is increasingly proving itself to be an unfit partner for this council, referring to the UN, and any country seeking peace and security for the people of South Sudan. The United States will never give up on its efforts, but if there is to be true peace in South Sudan, its leaders must set up, step up and make a true co commitment to end these conflicts once and for all." Unquote. If America intends to bring back peace to South Sudan with the cooperation of the present administration. Isn't it counterproductive to undermine a sitting government? Nikki Haley is a 
tough diplomat, a tough politician. She uses tough words. And her goal in using those tough words is to force the peace process forward. So I see her tough, her tough words were intended to challenge the leaders of this country, primarily on the government side, but also leaders of the opposition, challenge them to find a solution, challenge them to come together, make hard compromises, and find a solution for peace. So yes, her words were harsh. That was her intent. And her intent is to place a challenge um, before these leaders and say, lead. Lead your people. Lead a peace process. Lead your economy back to good health. And um, that's the challenge that, that we've placed before not only President Keir and his government, but we're placing the same challenge in front of the uh, opposition leaders. And the harsh measures that we talk about are intended for any spoiler. So the harsh measures we talk about are not just for the government of South Sudan. They're also for opposition leaders or opposition Bush commanders in the field who failed to, uh, to put peace as their first priority. So the intent was not to de delegitimize the incumbent administration? No. Uh, we're not in the business of delegitimizing anybody. We're in the interest of pushing forward the peace process, energizing the peace process, and that's why we're calling on all the parties, and especially civil society, to, um, to, to put energy into this process. Uh, again, we welcome the engagement of civil society in the talks. We welcome civil society's engagement to do their best to uh, report violations of the civil, uh, uh, or to, you know, report violations of the cessation of hostilities to CT SAM. And um, I've always urged civil society here to use its voice and to speak up for the sake of peace. Does the U.S. have confidence in the administration headed by President Salva Kiir Mayadis? We do if he seizes this opportunity. And I think it's within his command as a leader to seize that opportunity. Uh, we encourage it, and we're also encouraging the, oppo the opposition to do the same. So as I said, uh, Nikki Haley um, um, has had a good dialogue with President Keir. She's placed some challenges before him, and now it's, uh, it's in the hands of President Keir to uh, respond to that and to use his leadership skills um, to make some difficult choices and, uh, and help lead this country forward to a peace process. Your country has been going for months without an ambassador. And what should Juba do to speed these things up? Uh, the reason we don't have an ambassador is um, because the, uh, uh, our constitutional process requires the Senate to confirm any uh, ambassadorial nominee. President Trump has nominated a, a very fine ambassador um, but the Senate has chosen um, not to confirm that ambassador as a way to send a signal of its unhappiness uh, with the current government in terms of its inability so far to solve this five-year con conflict. I think if good things come from the peace dialogue and if there are serious compromises made and if the, if, if the stage is set for a peace agreement, I think uh, the U.S. Senate may well reconsider the situation and, and may be willing in that case to move forward with an ambassadorial nomination. So again, the ball is in the court of the, of the people of South Sudan and the South Sudanese government to create the conditions for good things to happen. So you have picked the coming of your ambassador on what happens at the talks. And if there's no progress, there's no ambassador in Juba. Well, I can't speak for the Senate, but certainly the Senate has high expectations just like the administration does. And so if those high expectations are met, uh, I, think, I think good things will follow. People say that uh, for the international community to sustain RCIS people, uh, they must listen to uh, local voices. The national dialogue as a homegrown solution is talked about as playing a similar role as the internationally back revitalization forum. Our eminent scholar uh, and ambassador at large uh, and the deputy uh, rapporteur for the National Dialogue, Dr. Francis Mading Deng, put it succinctly, and I quote, National Dialogue should be seen as complementary rather than contradictory to the revitalization initiative, nor should revitalization be seen as conflicting with National Dialogue, unquote. Do you agree? A hundred percent, yes. Uh, there's a distinct role for the revitalization forum, which involves the topmost leaders. And there's a distinct role for the national dialogue, which is more of a grassroots, ground-up process. Um, I think both processes are needed. Uh, I don't think the national dialogue by itself can bring peace to South Sudan. I don't think the revitalization forum by itself can bring peace to South Sudan. I think both processes are needed. 
And I think if things go in a positive direction, I wouldn't rule out ultimately that the, that the two processes could, could combine somehow into one and, and be a mechanism that will lead this country forward to peace. For a national dialogue to achieve its objectives, it needs support from the international community. Now there's the fanfare about the upcoming revitalization forum. Will money be put into the national dialogue? Um, or do you have some reservations about it? Uh, a number of our allies uh, are contributing money to the national dialogue process, which is allowing it to go forward. Um, the United States at this point has not chosen to, uh, to provide similar financial support to the national dialogue. Uh, we see one current existing weakness of the national dialogue is that it is not yet all-inclusive. Uh, we're not seeing participation from, uh, from the I.O. for the most part, and of course they have and a key the voice. I.O., Riyak Machar, and the National Dialogue team had gone time and again to South Africa, and Riyak Machar has, has refused to meet them. So the onus is on which side? Well, I think in part the onus is on all the parties of South Sudan to make progress at the high-level revitalization forum. That will be a key that will unlock many positive things. And I think it could also be a key that could unlock uh, this one piece of the national dialogue that still needs to be unlocked. So my focus right now and the focus of our government is on Addis next week. And again, if the parties can set aside their narrow individual interests, their narrow political party interests, and make some tough decisions, decide what they can give up for the sake of pushing peace forward, I think that will have many good benefits on many other issues, including on the national dialogue. Let's be optimistic. Assume that the high-level revitalization forum becomes a stunning success that is widely expected uh, to be, brings every major rebel group to the table, and results in the formation of an expanded Tigon in a country reeling in economic crisis. So, you have said that if that happens, money will be there. I'm confident that there will be a peace dividend. Uh, and a peace dividend can take many forms. Uh, South Sudan is a country rich in resources, rich in opportunity. But private business people are not inclined to invest here because of the danger, because of the fighting. If that can be unlocked, if the, uh, if the fighting can stop, uh, I think it won't just be international governments that will look for how they can contribute. I think it will also be international private businessmen will make their own decisions to come and invest in this country and trade in this country. So uh, uh, the key is reaching a peace deal. Good things will follow, whether it's from the private sector or whether it's from EGAD or whether it's from AU or whether it's from the Troika. I think everyone will be ready to step forward and support a viable peace process. So again, it comes back to what I said at the outset. The opportunity is there. The high-level revitalization forum has been created through hard work by EGAD and others. It creates an opportunity, and now it's up to the South Sudanese participants to seize that opportunity and do something good for the, for the people of South Sudan and for the future of this country. Can the high-level revitalization forum fix South Sudan? Only South Sudan can fix South Sudan. But South Sudan can use the revitalization forum as a tool to fix South Sudan. Can South Sudan be fixed? I think so. I'm confident. I believe in the people of South Sudan. Thank you for coming to the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. And that is Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. With me, Madingor, what is your idea for fixing the nation? Join me on a one-on-one -on -one debate.